My name is Michelle Prachonik, and I manage the shuttle food system for NASA. I, I also manage the food science research to go on to the moon and Mars or wherever NASA goes. First, I'd like to show you um, or discuss what our different options are for the different kinds of foods we have. We have no refrigerators or freezers on board. We take up too much volume, too much power, too much mass. So all of our food is shelf stable, meaning that the food has to be safe to eat even when it's stored at room temperature. So the way to do that is to either kill the microorganisms with heat or other means, like irradiation, or to dry the food down enough that the microorganisms that are harmful to you would um, not be able to thrive because they need water to thrive. So the first item is what we call our thermostabilized items. These items are basically canned foods in a pouch. They are processed under pressure with heat and basically um, and, and the, and the piece of equipment that we use is called a retort and uh, it's basically a large pressure cooker. And these products are heated to a temperature and a length of time to kill all the microorganisms um, all throughout the pouch and basically the crew members will heat these foods if they need to. Some of them are, are um, consumed cold or at room temperature and then if, when they're ready to eat they'll usually take the food and push it down and then cut along this end and they can eat with utensils. The food will stay in the package and stay on the utensil due to surface tension which allows the food to stick to the package. Uh, it will also stick to the utensils as long as the crew member does not pile on the food too much and then it will lose that ability to stick to the food. They also have to make sure that when they're eating on board that they um, eat carefully and not move the utensil, the, the fork or the spoon to their mouth too quickly otherwise it will fall off and, and fly through the air somewhere else. Uh, looks the same packaged the same but different is our irradiated foods and we have special permission from the Food and Drug Administration to produce nine food items for NASA through irradiation to commercial sterility. So this means we're, we're hitting the food with quite a bit of irradiation to kill those microorganisms. Again, these foods, would they are nine meat items so they all do need to be heated up and they do again eat um, out of the package. Some of our foods are dried down, and so this is an example of a freeze-dried product, and um, this happens to be vegetable quiche, and this product is produced in a freeze-dryer. The freeze-dryer um, works where you freeze the food, and then um, you pull a vacuum, and the ice crystals in the food, as you warm up the food, will go from ice to the gas phase. It, it misses that liquid phase. It's, it's called sublimation and that allows the cell structure of the food to stay uh, intact as, more than if you had air dried it and that allows for the rehydration of the product to be much more quick as well as um, higher quality. In the case of this food, all of our foods do have the labels, but in this case the labels will also include how much water to add and whether to add hot or, or cold or ambient water and how long to wait. And as they add the water, this vacuum that we have pulled as we package the food will, will, will um, dissipate and so that the crew members can then play with the food a little bit to make sure that the water gets into the food all the, in all the little crevices. We do pull a vacuum on our foods to minimize oxygen and water. Uh, oxygen will turn many foods rancid or have an off aroma or off flavor, similar to if you opened up an old um, bottle of oil and you smell it or old uh, jar of peanuts. The water makes items soggy. It will also increase the chemistry going on in the food because of water is often needed for those chemical reactions. Each of our food packages also have these little Velcoins and that's so that the food will, uh, that you can put that food either on a wall where there's the other piece of the Velcro or on their, their, uh, their, their pants will often have Velcro strips on them so that they can keep them from floating away when they um, are trying to prepare their meals. Um, this packaging is actually thermoform, so there, it is like a little cup, and so we, we actually get this material and they put it through a mold 
and heat it so that it becomes that little cup. The danger of that is if these corners get too thin, then the migration of um, oxygen and water through the package will be that more, much more likely. So we have to be very careful that these corners don't become too thin. We also have what we call our natural form or bite-sized foods. These foods are basically the middle aisle of the grocery store foods. So these are the items that we can purchase as is. We don't have to pr uh, produce at all. And we will repackage them in um, individual serving sizes as well as, again, the vacuum packing. These happen to be cashews. And again, we, don't wanna make, we wanna make sure that the cashews don't turn rancid too quickly. Our beverages are all dried. That's just an easy way to transport the um, beverages. And so we just add the water through the septum. Now this is the same septum that we, we see in the freeze dried or rehydratable items. And this septum allows a needle to be um, inserted in here from the portable water dispenser. And the water is added. This, there is a one-way valve in the septum, and so that one-way valve will um, not allow the liquid to come back out of the package once it's been hydrated. The septum is uh, a unique item for NASA. Um, we, we designed it, and, and there is a complication that you have to make sure that you have a sealing uh, protocol or process that allows that seal to maintain uh, its integrity past this septum because this piece goes all the way through. When the crew member is ready to drink, they do use a straw similar to a, a juice box straw. Um, we do have a firm tip on the bottom to allow for the insertion much more easily. Otherwise, it would, it would be very difficult to insert with a, um, with a flexible piece there. Now this one-way valve is uh, no longer one way. The, the hole is, is more, and so we um, have this hospital clamp. It's basically an IV clamp that we use to, to stop the liquid from going up. And so um, then we ask the crew members to make sure that they drink all of the liquid from the top of the clamp, or from the bottom of the clamp to the top of the straw. Tortillas are another part of our, what we call our natural form foods, but this is the most popular bread item that we do uh, fly on shuttle. We do fly some other bread items, but they, are, they come and we, we get them from a um, Department of Defense combat feeding program supplier, and they, are, they have an extended shelf life. But the problem with bread is that they can create crumbs, and we want to make sure that we minimize crumbs. And tortillas are a very nice way for the crew to have a bread type product, but also be able to use it with finger food. So they may either add peanut butter to it, or maybe they add some of the chicken fajitas that are in one of these pouch products, but they can slowly, carefully transfer some of these items. Um, this, these, this tortilla package has two tortillas, and you will also feel that there is a, um, an oxygen absorber in here, and that's to absorb any of the excess oxygen to prevent mold and yeast from growing on the tortillas and extend the shelf life. We, we do bring up several condiments. Um, not surprisingly, our salt has to be in, uh, in water and our pepper and oil so that those granules do not float away and not get on the food. Again, surface tension is very good because we can just touch the salt to the food and, um, and then mix it around. The top for each of the salt and pepper shaker is tethered, so we don't lose that top as they are trying to add their salt and pepper. We also will uh, include other condiments into the food, whether it's the little food service packs of mayonnaise, mustard, uh, taco sauce, and sometimes with a special request, we may add, put a little bit of hot sauce or taco sauce or one of their favorite sauces in a plastic bottle. We like to avoid glass as much as possible. Glass, if it breaks, would be very dangerous on orbit. So if we do have to use a, some glass, we will, uh, we will wrap it with the um, uh, prescription tape, which is a very heavy tape so that even if the glass breaks, it will, it will be contained within that, that tape. 
The shuttle crew eats sometimes off of a tray. This tray allows for the magnetized utensils to stay to on the tray. There is a magnetic strips. Um, they bring up a fork, spoon, knife, and scissors are very important. Um, to eat these packages, out of these packages, the crew can either cut along three sides or an X, and that will allow them to open it up with just a flap and eat again out of the package. They also, this tray has the Velcro strips, or Velcro on it, so that you can stick the package in here. And um, it also has the bungee cord for the condiments. And then it has a two st um, straps here that the crew member can then put around their legs so that the crew, they, they eat as if they're, if they're sitting, they're, the tray is on their lap. Okay, I gotta think what else I need to do. Excuse me. Uh, no, we don't need that. Never mind. Um, okay. The astronaut for the shuttle, we've done one crew session get to get them used to the food and the different, um, and so that they can start ranking the food or rating the food on a one to nine hedonic scale. We tell the crew that as they are eating the foods and they get to eat about 55 or 60 items, both beverages and foods, that nine is really, really good, one is awful. Anything six or higher is fair game for their menu. And sometimes the crew member will ask our dietitian to make them, to develop the menu for them based on their, their preferences. Sometimes the crew member will develop their own menu and other times they'll take a baseline menu or a menu that they may have flown before and make some changes with the additions of the foods that we have. We do have about 180 food items. That does not include the fact that when you add, uh, you, you drink your coffee, if you drink your coffee with cream and sugar, the cream and the sugar would have to be added to the package. And so, that, so that's why it's not, it's really more than 180 items, but we like to say it's like 180 unique items. And um, so the crew members are able to try about a third of those items. They do have the option to ask for more of the food items to try later if they would like. Um, and that's up to them and up to uh, our time. We have also, for a few crews, had a second food session if they have enough foods that they want to try. Excuse me. Um, the nutritional requirements in space are a little bit different than what you have on Earth. The calorie requirements are the same, especially when you go onto to International Space Station where you are exercising two hours a day. So if you eat about 2,400 kilocalories on Earth, you're going to eat about the same on orbit. Um, we do try to decrease salt. Salt has become uh, risk factors for various medical issues and health issues. And so we would like to bring the salt level down. We're in that, we're in process of doing that currently, but the ideal level would be lower or equal to 3,000 uh, milligrams of sodium per person per day. Iron, we try to keep a little bit lower. It it's gets a little bit too high, and that also has some physiological changes or, or issues. Um, calcium, we'd like to make higher to minimize the bone loss, but really just adding calcium and taking vitamin D supplements is not enough, and they do have to exercise two hours a day. Some crew members will have special needs, whether it's they're lactose intolerant or um, they tend to want more vegetarian, and we can certainly take care of that for a shuttle menu. We do have enough items that either don't uh, include dairy products or don't include um, as many meat products, but we would have to develop more foods for International Space Station or a long duration mission for those kinds of crew members with special requirements. We have yet to have any one fly that has like a peanut allergy, and that would probably never happen just because 
Um, the peanuts are on the menu in several different forms, both in the raw form as well as in some of the um, menu items, such, such as chicken and peanut sauce and, of course, peanut butter. And it would be too difficult to keep those crew members away from the aromas and, and, and issues with the peanuts. Uh, we also have on shuttle what we call fresh food. And fresh food are those items that are not on our official food list, and we have some requirements for the crew members if they pick certain you know, if they're fresh foods. One is it needs to be shelf stable, meaning that it can be stored at room temperature for about a month to 45 days, because typically we can load that fresh food on board about 30 hours prior to launch, so we can keep it in the refrigerator until maybe six hours before that, so maybe a day and a half before launch. It will stay on the shuttle for up to 48 hours. So if the launch is delayed a day, the fresh food is not taken out of the mid-deck locker. It stays there. If it's delayed more than two days, then we do get the food back at Kennedy Space Center crew quarters. Um, and then we would replace those items that might have an issue. But we can bring up fresh fruits, such as apples, pears, oranges. We can bring up carrots and celery. Um, some crew members have asked for other fruits and we do allow them to bring them up with the understanding that some of them may not be good for too long and we try to find the most fresh and firm foods as possible, maybe even a little bit not at, not at the peak of their um, ripeness quite, quite at the time that we, we purchase them. All of the fresh food that we do put on board is cleaned as well as any of our, our, our other food to make sure there are no contaminations, no germs on the food. Um, other fresh food items that are requested are special candies, uh, special beef jerkies, or other items for our international crew members. We will often have special international foods. It can be Canadian foods. It can be Italian foods. We've, we've um, had some special Japanese foods. So all of those would go through um, our initial evaluation. It, many of them, unless they're commercial items, will go through microbiological testing to make sure that they meet all our microbiological standards. And the um, packaging will be considered in making sure that there's nothing that may contaminate um, based on the, pa the packaging. All of our packaging, as we develop new packaging or look at the, con um, have been tested for all of the standard packaging tests as well as a test called off-gassing to make sure that all of the packaging ha doesn't give off too many contaminants, trace contaminants that might uh, collect up in the, in the vehicle. We, that, for the same reason, we make our own labels and they are black and white so that there isn't any contamination that way and um, we keep our packaging as simple as possible. How does, uh, The, um, the food has changed quite a bit. The first food that was consumed was applesauce out of a tube, like a toothpaste tube. And at that time, we didn't even know if a human could even eat or drink on orbit and digest their food. And we're happy to report that we can do that. Um, so we started with, with basically tubes and cubes. And the tubes were the pureed foods such as applesauce and puddings, et cetera. And then the cubes were compressed cubes that might have been sandwiches or other um, bite-sized ingredients that they would be able to eat as is. The comments that we got from the crew was it tasted fine. It just wasn't very satisfying because it didn't feel like they were eating food because they weren't eating it the way they were used to. By Apollo time, we, we, we um, added We've, we had been adding foods, but we started with what we called our spoon bowl. And it looked, it, it was, I guess, most similar to this because the, the astronauts were able to eat out of the package and it was like a bowl. And um, the beginning of shuttle, we actually had a hard bowl type, uh, it, was, it was a square um, package, and they would hydrate through the side. And we moved away from that because hard packages are hard to throw away. 
or you can't collapse them as much, and you can't stow as much. So these packages are very easy to stow because they just, we can really stow them very tightly and there's very little excess space that we're not using for stowage. Our um, retorted products, our thermostabilized products, are coming from our um, space food research facility at Texas A&M University. We um, have a collabor collaboration between Texas A&M University, Wiley Laboratories, and NASA. So all of our about 60 or so items come out of that facility. The freeze-dried items, most of them come out of our own Space Food Systems Laboratory. We have a freeze dryer. Some of them are already freeze dried through a company in Oregon, Oregon Freeze Dry, and um, we'll just repackage those items. The tortillas we purchase and then repackage, so they're a commercial tortilla product. The irradiated foods we actually get through uh, the Department of Defense, uh, Natick Labs Combat Feeding Program, and those products, they actually get produced uh, at a facility in Florida. Um, our beverages, we purchase the beverages off the commercial market and then repackage those items. Um, the packaging itself, we purchase um, from suppliers. This packaging is the same packaging that's used for the Meals Ready to Eat for the Department of Defense, and so we just go to their suppliers to purchase these packages. Uh, these packages have a, an aluminum foil layer, which allows for great barrier properties to oxygen and water. Um, so we really like these packages. They are not going to be very useful in the future. Uh, we are looking at two emerging technologies, one being microwave sterilization, and that requires no foil layer because microwaves and foil don't go well together. And the other, um, pro the other emerging technology is pressure-assisted uh, thermal sterilization, or PATS. And there, these materials, these are basically a four-layer material where one layer is the foil, and those layers will delaminate during the pressure process. So we're, we, we would need to look for high barrier poly-type materials for those new processes. Um, this material is a commercial product. Um, it's called Combatherm. And again, we find a supplier that allows us to heat thermoform or, or heat um, mold the bottom, and then the top comes directly from Combatherm. And that's the same material that we use for this process also. The beverages are also in a foil-like material. Um, until recently, we were using the same material that Capri Sun was in, and so we're look, we're, we've identified a very similar material to that material for our new, uh, and again, it's a commercial product. Have you found that the crew member tastes change in space versus uh, how they may taste your heart? So we have heard um, anecdotal reports from the crew that taste changes over time or uh, when they're on orbit. Um, their taste, what we get mostly, is that it doesn't have as much flavor as when they're on Earth. Sometimes they say it's just different. And we have several theories of why that's happening. One is um, about 85 to 90% of what you eat is what, or what, 85 to 90% of what you smell is what you actually taste. And so if you're not smelling, then you're really not going to be um, tasting the food as well. And so we think because in microgravity, hot air is no longer rising, it can be going to your feet or to the ceiling or to your elbows, that that hot air where, is, where the aromas are, are not getting to your nose. In addition, especially at the beginning when they've just gotten into orbit, they, a lot of their fluid shifts to their heads and they, get, they feel very congested because of the extra fluid and they don't smell as much. And so again, they're not smelling enough. And another reason is we heat up our food in the ovens, but we're not really heating them to piping hot temperatures. And in addition, we're not putting it on a nice big plate where all the aromas would be coming at you and, and you could smell it. Instead, they're just opening up these small little holes and that's not allowing those aromas to leave. And the, Last reason is more psychological. 
that as they are away from home, and even though it's very exciting and they're really happy to be up there, it is different for them, and they often will crave the comfort foods, the meatloaf, the macaroni and cheese, um, those items that they may have grown up with, and so that's what they're looking for more than the other items that we, we provide them. What's the most popular food for One of the most popular items is shrimp cocktail, which is one of our freeze-dried items, and it's, um, I think, very popular because it's very spicy. Our, our, our cocktail sauce has extra amount of horseradish sauce on it, and it's, so it's really good. And even and crew members know to just bring up what they want. And some will even bring them up because they can use it for bartering with other crew members or with the International Space Station crew. So shrimp cocktail is very popular. Tortillas, extremely popular. We probably send up over 200 tortillas for each flight. Um, with a crew of seven for 14 days. So it's, it's a lot of tortillas. Coffee is very popular. And then some of the uh, food items like the beef brisket is very popular. Our chocolate pudding cake and our cherry blueberry cobbler dessert items are very popular. So, you know, our astronauts are people just like we are. So we all have our own tastes and likes and dislikes. Um, I've enjoyed working with the different crews. I think um, the crew member that I enjoyed working with a lot was Barbara Morgan. She was our, our second teacher in space, and she flew on STS-118. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what food items might be appropriate for education. Um, how, could we, how could she do like a counting game for preschoolers using uh, foods? and there was a lot of discussion because our first choice was probably doing like a peanut M&Ms because they were colorful and big and, and easy to eat. But she got a little bit of, of um, comments from some of the, the educators that she was working with and some of the uh, TV shows saying, but they're not very healthy. Can we find something healthy? And what she was going to try to do and was to eat the foods to say, if I had five and I ate two, and would show them all floating around. Um, and something like carrots would just be too hard to eat. So we ended up still using the peanut M&Ms. And uh, I think it worked out very well for her. Let's see what else I'm supposed to do. Oh. Um, our crew members go into quarantine for about a week prior to the shuttle launch. About Three to four days of that is in Houston at Johnson Space Center, and then the rest are at Kennedy Space Center. During that time, the crew eats and sleeps at crew quarters, and they have minimal contact with the um, outside world and other people unless they've gotten what we call a primary contact badge or been approved, knowing that if we're sick, we shouldn't go near the crew and how to you know, make sure that we're washing our hands and making sure all the food is very clean. So all the food is um, extra clean, both the food packaging and um, any food, uh, fruits and vegetables that we bring in are, are really cleaned very well. All that food is, is produced at crew quarters in the kitchens and then the crew eats. Um, they are allowed during crew quarters to ask for special items for snacking and for drinks. And then we do have them look at their, the menus that we're planning to um, to cook for them prior to their launch, about a month before their launch, we'll have a crew session so that they understand what's, what's going to happen. It is tradition that they have a barbecue meal at the Beach House at Kennedy Space Center. And that's uh, always the night before launch. And it's with all the family members and families that have gotten this primary contact badge. Um, we tend to have one maybe two guest meals at Johnson Space Center's crew quarters. And that will often be the spouses or maybe one of their older children. Uh, children younger than, I think, eight years old. And it has changed over the years to be younger. It used to be maybe 12 or 14 are allowed to see 
their um, parents prior to launch during this quarantine period um, so that they, they have some time to spend with them. Um, so we do have our, so we, so our, it, within our lab, we're not only developing the menus for their actual mission up in orbit, but also for this quarantine time, the HSP Health Stabilization Program, and as well for their um, time at Kennedy Space Center's crew quarters during TCDT, which is the Terminal Countdown Test Demonstration, or their dress rehearsal, which will often happen about three weeks before their launch. And we will provide meals for them for the two and a half days or so that they're down there. Um, during that time at Kennedy Space Center, both during launch as well as during um, the TCDT, we are not only supporting meals for the crew, but we're also supporting meals for a lot of the um, support team. And that includes the flight doctors and the um, mission management folks, the what we call C-squares, which are the crew, uh, they're actual astronauts who help support the astronauts who are going up in orbit in their mission. So there's always a lot of people there. Um, so there's, uh, we, we can serve for a mission on the order of about 200 meals during the, um, the quarantine period at KSC. And everyone will get the same meals. Uh, often, some, or quite often, the, the support team will eat at a different time. So if dinner is for the, the shuttle crew at 5 o'clock, then it may be 6 o'clock for the support team. All those schedules are provided to us by the scheduler th and through the, uh, the mission, uh, the VITS team, the vehicle integration team, and so we know in advance when those meals will be and how long they have um, for those meals. Um, once the mission is completed and we will get the um, menu trays and all the food back, fresh food, pantry food, as well as the menu trays back from KSC. All that food does get de-stowed, and we take that food and use it for training. So um, we support any of the simulations or sims at Johnson Space Center that are longer than six hours. We provide food for the crew, or even if it's a generic sim for whoever is sitting in the uh, simulator doing that sim, whether it's for mission planning or whatever. Um, we also get back all the utensils, and those utensils are actually cleaned and delivered back to the crew members. That's their little um, take home from their mission, so they do get their, their uh, utensils back. They do not get the scissors back, those we keep. The crew will often, or will also sometimes ask for some of their food back so that they can use their food for public affairs outreach events so that they can show them that this was what they didn't eat, but this is what they had on orbit. Um, so th and, and then we have to clean all of the menu trays and um, get them ready for the next mission. We also have, um, in, in addition to the menu trays and the, and the fresh food trays, we have what's called the pantry food. And this is three smaller trays that are up, uh, stowed with some of the more popular items or common items of the menus for all the crew members. And this is the, about two days of extra food that's there for if they have to wave off their, their landing, that they make, we make sure that they have some extra food on board. Um, and it'll have a, it will also have items like um, chicken consomme, a soup, in case they're not feeling well the first day or two, because some of them do uh, experience space sickness, and they may feel a little nauseous or sick, and so sometimes chicken consomme is good. We will also put in the pantry um, some gum, in case they want some gum to chew. For shuttle missions, the crew members do tend to lose weight, some more than others, and a lot of it is due to the fact that they've just got a very um, busy time, timeline during the mission, and they also want to try to get done as much as possible while they're up there. And so the result is they may eat breakfast, 
but they'll probably be running around so they may grab something for lunch so it's not usually a full meal and then they may sit down for dinner um, but quite often they will not eat as much as they should we see about 30 percent of the food come back and but we don't know exactly how much especially now that we are um, docking to International Space Station and there's a crew of six up there quite often the commander or someone on the shuttle crew will assess how much food they'll need to go come home and anything else they'll transfer to International Space Station so that they have some extra food so the last few missions we've seen very little food come back or a lot less food just because um, they're they're just transferring it so we don't really know how much they're eating um, we do we do hear a lot that they don't eat as much as they should, but there are always some crew members that eat all of their food, and so we don't feel comfortable not stowing all of the food that we should be stowing. Mm. Um, on the day of launch, the crew members do bring up what we call uh, they carry on sandwiches and basically a lunch. They eat, they, ba they eat breakfast and lunch before they leave for the vehicle and to, to get ready for launch. But quite often, it'll be quite a, quite a bit of time before they can set up the galley and, and really be ready to eat a real hot meal. So we do provide them with sandwiches. So sandwiches are their own choice, but we try to um, limit it to turkey or peanut butter and jelly or ham. Um, and we will not put the condiments, we won't put like mayonnaise on, this, on the bread, but just pack it with the mayonnaise because otherwise the bread could get pretty soggy by the time they eat it. We also will bring up there the, um, some water containers for them that we have pre-filled and some carrots or celery if they ask for it. And, um, and I think that's it, nothing else. Um, during landing, or right before they land, the crew fluid loads. So while they've been on orbit, they have lost a significant amount of their body fluids due to the reallocation um, of the fluid within their bodies. And what we found is if we don't allow the crew, if we don't have the crew fluid load or drink a lot of fluids prior to, launch, prior to landing, then they will actually um, get very dizzy and nauseous when they come down. And so we provide them with a high salt drink or salt tablets and water and the amount is based on their weight, body weight, and so they're usually drinking something on the order of 48 ounces in the couple hours prior to landing. Now, if there is a wave off, we provide them with enough for at least one more um, fluid load, and basically we, we stow one and a half fluid loads worth times two, So um, because if there's a partial wave off and then they're going to go back and try again later in the morning or the evening. We want to make sure that if they want they can drink some more afterwards or during that time. Um, currently the, reg the requirement is that they, ca they need to fill those bags up the day of the landing. They were pre-filling these fluid load container or packages, beverage pouches the night before because they're just so busy the day of launch and they want to be able to turn to shut down the galley but we're concerned with microbiological um, contamination happening and so we have asked them to make sure that they are that those bags are not consumed after about 24 to 30 hours and so if they fluid load the day of then they may be able to use it the next day. But if they fluid load the night before, then they're just going to have to throw away those filled bags. And many commanders and crews just don't want to bring, bring back a lot of wet trash because it's just a hard place to put it. They don't know where to put all that, especially if you've got four bags times seven crew members. It's 28 bags that need to be thrown away in, in trash. Um, 
The shelf life on shuttle food is about nine months to one year. So we can, we can package these foods and have them good for that length of time. The fresh food has to have a shelf life of about 30 days or more, um, but not less than that just because of what we're trying to do. Um, so we have to be careful with those foods. Right after all the food is stowed and sent to KSC, which happens about two weeks prior to launch or a month prior to launch, uh, the stowage drawings are developed and that will tell us all what, where exactly all the food is. And so that if I get a call from Mission Control saying the crew can't find X or they're wondering if there's extra of this on board, can you find it for us? I have the stowage drawing to be able to look for those items and tell them exactly where they are. I've, I also forward those stowage drawings to the stowage lead for the, um, for the mission so that they have it also because quite often that request will come to the stowage lead first and, and then to me second. Um, we had an example on STS-125, which was the Hubble telescope mission, where they were not docking with the International Space Station, and so we had to provide contingency food in case the crew had to wait for a rescue vehicle to come. The, the um, plan was that if a rescue vehicle had to be there, it would take about 20, two weeks to 30 days for them to uh, be able to get up to the, the, the vehicle, the shuttle, and so we had to provide some low weight and um, low volume food items. What we ended up with were bars, food bars, but what we had to make sure was a certain percentage of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. The concern was that the lithium hydroxide canisters that clean the, the air of carbon dioxide were the um, short pole in this and that we didn't have enough space or, or volume, volume or mass allocation to put too many of these canisters on board. And so we had to have the crew expire as low amount of carbon dioxide as possible. And to do that, we needed a menu that was higher in fat and lower in protein and, and, and um, carbohydrate. And so we had to find combinations of bars and we ended up adding some peanuts or cashews or almonds to some of the diets to provide for the crew members. They had to again, have the, the bar, we didn't feed them as many calories as they would normally need, but we fed them about 30 to 40% less of what they needed and it was based on their um, kilogram weight of their, of their body weight. These bars were stowed in Ziploc bags underneath the floor, the, the shuttle floorboard, so they weren't really easy to get to, but would be able to be um, obtained if they needed them. Fortunately, we did not need them, and so all those bars came back um, on the vehicle, all intact. How about EVA crew members? Do they eat during an EVA? The EVA crew members don't have the capability to eat anything once they're suited. Um, they are, they do have the ability to drink water. Right now, they, our, our protocol is what we call camp out for the EVA crew members. So the night before the EVA, they actually go into a um, part of the ISS, International Space Station vehicle, where they can reduce down the uh, pressure so that they basically are pre-breathing um, for many hours beforehand. The limitation there is this location doesn't have a galley. So they basically have to bring in foods for breakfast that don't need heating. And they might be able to pass through quickly some of the beverages for hydration. So we, add, so they, um, we also would like them, just because it, it will keep them less hungry, is to have um, a diet high in soluble fiber. And so we and we'll, so we'll ask them, they have several choices from different kinds of bars to whole wheat tortillas with peanut butter. Um, and so they can pick and choose about four different EVA meals that they, um, they're 
pre-EVA pre meals. Those items are um, currently stowed for them on the day of that EVA. So if we stow by day, then it would be on that EVA day. We sometimes stow by crew member, in which case it, it's then organized by day from there so that they can find their food. Um, the bars were for quite a while not on our official food list. And that meant all of the bars had to go into fresh food, which took up a lot of space in fresh food since we're only allocated two fresh food containers per mission. And half of one of those containers is, is set aside for International Space Station requests. And so the, um, what we made a decision not too long ago is to take and put about 40 different bars on the official food list. And that way we can stow those bars into the regular menu food trays. Um, those bars are not repackaged. We do have a bit of a, a compensation on that. So, but we do know that all these materials that these materi that these pack these bars are packaged in do not off gas. We've we've tested all of them. What is the uh, shuttle galley consist of? What is it actually? What's the shuttle galley is has a hydration system, or a portable water dispenser, which you can dial up how many ounces, and they're within half ounce increments, as well as. Um, whether it's hot or cold water. Uh, the hot water is sort of warm, and the cold water is not too cold. The water is not hot enough for, um, so quite often, if you have to wait 10 to 15 minutes after you've hydrated, let's say, the vegetable quiche, you may put it into the shuttle oven, which is basically a, um, a little box that has some metal plates so that you can put the food, the pouch food between the two metal plates. So basically through conduction, you get the heat heated through. And then there's a fan that helps to um, distribute the heat evenly in the, in the little oven. It's, it's not very big at all. And that's basically what they do. They heat, hydrate, and eat. Um, crew debrief. We, we do a brief debrief, um, usually about a month after they come home. We get about 15 minutes or a half hour at the most, but usually about 15 minutes for our crew debrief. We ask them questions on how did something special, you know, if something was done special, how did that happen? Um, you know, we've had, we had comments several missions ago that they could not find the utensils, which were stowed in the pantry. and. We figured out that the reason they weren't finding it is because we were stowing them sort of upright like this, and they would look down and not be able to see them. So now we put the, the utensils flat so they can see them. Um, we have also had a lot of comments about the, the nets that are on the menu trays. We have nets that are in pieces that allow the food not to float away when the tray is pulled out of the mid-deck locker. These, tray, these nets in the back often get very uh, get caught up, and so we have made some adjustments to the nets, and then we instruct the crew uh, to just be very careful when they pull out, pull out or pull back in that those nets don't get caught. Um, we've had some discussions about the, the portable water dispenser. Even if you say I'm dialing up for three ounces, it may not deliver the three ounces. It may deliver a little bit less or a little bit more. But the crew is aware of that, and so they are just very cautious to make sure that they watch it a little bit. There has been some leakage from the, dis the portable water dispenser, and for a while we thought it was due to our septum, but actually it was more due to some of the pressure changes in the portable water dispenser. Space travelers cooking, whether in a vehicle or in a habitat, is that something that's just probably not going to happen? And if it isn't going to happen, isn't that a kind of a serious impact? Can you imagine going three years without being able to cook on a mission to Mars? So we have seen one crew member cook on an International Space Station, and that was Sandy Magnus. And she would actually ask for her fresh food, um, onion and garlic and balsamic vinegar, and some other items, and she would actually, through the galley, 
the Russian galley, um, she would try to um, cook onions. She would cut them in half or quarters and add some vinegar and, or some other items and cook them in the galley. Usually took several hours. It's a real challenge on orbit to do that. She says she lost an awful lot of onion pieces uh, floating around. She, she finally figured out how to do it, but it took a lot of um, planning and knowing that she had everything right at her fingertips. Once we're on a surface that has some gravity, I think we will start cooking some meals. Um, then we have we don't have to worry about things floating around as much, and we so and we can start looking at preparing foods. Our hope is if um, that we can grow some fruits and vegetables in environmentally controlled chambers, and harvest those fruits and vegetables, and either clean them and pick them and eat them, or pick them, clean them, eat them, or actually maybe cook with them. For example, maybe carrots can become carrot juice, or maybe you can saute tomatoes and bell peppers and onions and, and garlic and make a tomato sauce. And um, so there would be some real cooking going on in the galley. I describe our galley, our potential galley could be a 17th century galley, galley with 21st century equipment. Um, some of the gourmet cooking appliances like bread makers or juicers or pasta makers would fit in very well. The problem is everything would have to be pre-cut, so you can't go to the grocery store and buy your um, shoestring carrots or your you know, already sliced mushrooms. You would have to do all that yourself. And so there is, it would be time consuming, but I, as Sandy Magnus said, it was to her, that was her relaxation, to be able to create and cook. And she does that on Earth, so why not do it when she was on International Space Station?